Madam Chair, make, Start. Madam Chair, make no mistake. This is about removing the barrier of entry that for centuries have blockaded women from entering the workplace. It is about things like job discrimination, the fact that certain companies believe it is justified to place upon women quotas it's about how many women can enter their company. It's about locking them into a system in which they are unable to prove their worth based on things that they never chose and things that we think are factually untrue. We don't think women should be discriminated because of their gender. We think that they are equal equally capable to balance their relationship life with their future plans and their jobs. We do not think, and that if opposition suggests that lying will hurt them, or it's somehow unjustified, is to suggest that women are incapable of aspiring to the same height that we think men can do. Make no mistake, this is about liberating women from the shackles of the patriarchy we are so proud to propose. I have two arguments on side of opening government. Number one, I'm going to structurally prove to you why the patriarchy in the status quo subjugates women in deeply pernicious ways. Number two, I'll tell you why what exactly constitutes a justification for something and why this is justified because it liberates women from the shackles of the patriarchy. Number one, why the patriarchy in the status quo subjugates women. Number one, First layer, understand how the patriarchy views relationship status and future plans during job interview. There are multiple prongs to this. Number one, in terms of patriarchal norms with regards to relationship statuses, women are more likely to be seen as individuals who are susceptible, individuals who are inferior and have to be submissive to their husbands. What that necessarily means is that individuals are less likely to want to hire them because hiring a woman necessarily equates to them not having the same kind Kind of commitment to their job that a man would. We don't think that these claims are true, but these are stereotypes and these are perceptions that perpetuate throughout society. Number two, it also means that women are seen as emotionally less capable. We think that uh, like societal narratives such as the damsel in distress and all these sorts of things are perpetuations of the idea that women cannot handle the same level of emotional, of mental stress. What that means is to a male employer, women are less likely to be Hired because they believe that once uh, they have a lot of stress or when their workload gets quite heavy, that they are unable to cope, right? The second thing to note is about future plans, right? Because notice that women are perniciously biologically assaulted as a result. Because understand that when a woman says something like, I plan to have a family in the future, I want to have two children, the idea or the prospects of them having to go on something like maternity leave in and of itself means that corporations are less likely to want to hire them. Why is this the case? When you have to take nine months off, that means less productivity in your company. That means less profits that are made by your corporations that we believe are profit motivated. That means that your uh, like action of proposing what you want to do in the future is also going to directly assault you. This doesn't happen for men because they don't have to give birth to children, because they don't have to take care of their family in the future, those sorts of things, right? The reason why this is horrible is because it has been continually perpetuated by traditional media, right? That is to say that things like Fox News, things like Breitbart, things like even tabloids like The Sun, The Daily Mail. And it continues to circulate even in the 21st centuries, right? And just to note, right? We don't have a time place setting for this debate. It cannot just be uh, located in countries where women equality is getting better. So we can't set it to just the United States or the United Kingdom. This takes place all across the world. We consider here, here. women in China, women in Nigeria, all these places in which we think lying is the exclusive mechanism to liberate themselves from the shackles of the patriarchy. The second layer of analysis, why exactly um, uh, do we think that this is unjustified, right? Because understand that this is all based on unfounded claims. That's to say, we do not actually think that women are inferior, right? That all these things are perpetuated by lies, by politicians, by social media, that we think is in and of itself unjustified because all of these things are true. We need to give women the platform to liberate themselves, right? I don't think it's a surprise that we see that the job market is inherently patriarchal. That is to say that 90% of CEOs are men, right? The direct translation of societal narratives is one that directly translate into job discrimination. That is to say that if you see an equally merited man and a woman, a job is more likely to hire the men instead. Number two, 
Second argument, why is this justified? Because we think that this liberates women from the shackles of patriarchy. We draw the parallel that this is akin to self-defense, right? So for example, if you have no alternative, when someone is trying to assault you or shoot you, it is justified to retaliate in means like self-defense, right? Why exactly does this constitute self-defense? Number one, understand that the odds are stacked against you. That's to say that literally the Inherent patriarchy of the job market means that number one, women are unable to attain social mobility. That means that because they're unable to enter the workplace in the first place, or it's very limited in scope to what jobs they can do, they cannot make their own uh, money, right? That means that they lack uh, financial capital, which translates into like their wider experience of life. So if you have less financial capital, you have also less political capital, right? These sorts of things continue to perpetuate the cyclical narrative of what uh, uh, that women are somehow inferior. But number two, it also means that you are literally deprived of human rights in some instances, that you're not paid the same kind of wages, that you're paid under minimum wage, that this happens very commonly, especially in developing countries, right? But the second thing to note is that this is targeted identity assault. That's to say that they're literally targeting who you are as a person, something that you never chose, something that is inherent to you. We draw the parallel to, for example, gay people or Muslims, right? Who we say it's okay to be closeted, right? It's okay for Jews to lie when they're trying to run from Nazis in Nazi Germany, right? These are the sorts of things. It, this is a direct comparison to that. Why exactly does lying remove this barricade? We think that lying about your relationship status and future plans means that women are able to show themselves and um, show themselves as individuals who are capable to work. So even if they take up a relationship at the side of that, we think they'll be able to have that balance and prove to the rest of the world that women can find that balance in the workplace, that they are not the same as other people want you to believe. It's getting our foot in the door and seeing the value of women in the workplace where they're currently denied the opportunity. Under side opposition, they're literally anti-woman because women will never be able to break the glass ceiling that the patriarchy imposes upon them. We also think that you get things like greater challenges challenges to patriarchal norms at a point at which more women can enter the workplace and therefore show their worth, uh, like create a bigger proportion of the country's GDP, all those sorts of things. For all these reasons, OG is the side that stands with women very proud to propose. Okay, thank you for your speech. I would like to call upon the leader of opposition to open their case within seven minutes. Here, here. Can you all hear me? Yes. Start. Start. So, to the extent the opening government talked about the explicit quota of women and how strong the patriarchy is in the status quo, they agree that the current struggle of women stretches beyond the relationship balances. There are far more other reasons why people are sexist and will continue to be sexist even if women lie about this, right? For example, things like stereotypes of the white alpha male leader, of painting female leaders as bossy and aggressive and thus not promoting them. Things like men from STEM only want to hire other men because they look alike and feel like they're more trustworthy. Things like structural barriers in developing countries that constrain women from going into higher education and thus getting a really good job. We don't get the solvency that OG talked about, about solving and dismantling the entire patriarchy. At the very best of the case, we get a marginal benefit of some women getting their jobs. Why is this not justified? Why is this marginal benefit so bad? Because our stance is very clear. Every time someone lies, it casts a negative social externality on the same group, which, which spirals into point, a cycle point. of distrust and lead to more and more stereotypes about women. Let's be very clear here today. This lie will get found out. To the extent that people do want to get married and people do want to give birth because of like because things like family pressure, societal pressure, media internalization of being uh, being good is like having babies, people will still want to give birth to baby in the future, right? So like this non-binding promise can be easily broken and this lie will be exposed into the future. Corporations will see that these women, although they said that they won't they will keep up with their promises, will or are actually just like lying about these promises, right? Given this assumption, two clear arguments for you to weigh in this round. First, is a principal argument Point. why lying Point. is not justified. I'll take you later. Why lying is not justified because it harms other women. 
Firstly, we think you lying creates doubt upon other women in the future. So less likely you're going to hire female employers in the future. For people who are explicitly racist, so use this as an excuse not to hire female workers. The comparative on our side of the house is that they do have to hire women to some extent because of public pressure. Given that they can use a scapegoat saying that women are not being like very, are not upholding their integrity, they can choose not to hire them. For people who are implicitly racist, we'll attribute characteristical judgment about female workers. So think twice before hiring hiring women. This opting in creates stere social stereotypes that women in the workforce simply like to get into their position. Point. This invalidates female achievements Point. in higher positions. We tell you it is also less likely for women to be promoted into higher positions because integrity is an important characteristic in which corporations care about, right? It is easy for them to assume if you are lying about something such as like um, your relationship status, it is also very likely for you to lie about other parts of resume, things that are like implicitly not true, but things that can be interpreted, right? So like we tell you integrity is, is kind of is pretty important in terms of workforce and well very easy for people who have some sort of internalized racism to use this against women. What does this mean? This means there's gonna be less networking opportunities for women, there's gonna be less jobs who are gonna be offered for a majority of women. To the very extent that OG talks about this impact, this impact flows to opposition. Even if that's not true, it is still not justified because you step upon woman's shoulder who actually wants to get married and pursue a relationship. This creates a vicious competition in which company no longer hire women who actually value like family life. Right? We believe it is an individual choice Point. for people to pick, Point. but hire based upon your lies. You are also stepping on woman's shoulder who has a strong moral metric not to lie when it comes to important life decisions. Right? You lying necessarily opts in and steps upon the shoulder of two part of these minorities to the extent the minority rights do matter in the status quo, we tell you it is principally not justified for you to do so. You are just opting into a system in which minority combats minorities, right? To the extent that it creates excuses for corporations to act against your entire group. Certainly, we believe that alternatives do exist in the status quo, right? Simply, you cannot talk about these things when they're acting as an interview. You can say you're not sure about like uh, about like whether or not you are going to do in the future, right? You can and you point. can provide them with a vague point. answer. You can point to other parts about the impressive parts about your resume, right? We tell you it's not the only alternative for you to opt in into lying. We tell you this then restores to send combat the stereotypes that we have against women in the status quo. Now. On a more practical note, what does this mean, right? We tell you, on a more practical note, it also means that there's going to be less social movement about women's rights after marriage. There's going to be less social movement about maternal leaves, things like kindergarten and work, things like sponsorship of childhood education, things like by offering a woman a vacation after they give birth, things that are very important to female rights and to women workers' rights in particular that allows them to work in, in the current workforce given the patriarchal structure. What is this? Why, why is this largely going to happen? Right? Because socially, people will use a rhetoric against women in these positions. Right? Social, they're less likely going to garner social support because, get, because society can say you agree not to give birth and now you are giving birth so you don't deserve the rights that you are talking about here. It is very an important rhetoric because it is very easy for Point. conservatives Point. or people who are moderately, I will take you at six, for people who are moderately conservative to come back and to use this views against the woman. It essentially also means that corporations can also use this as an essential excuse to denounce the move, move, movement that these like union workforces can pursue, right? If women tells if women collectivizes and tells the workforce, ah, you need to provide us for maternal leaves, the corporation can simply point to your interview so that you promise not to do certain things to the extent that we value business integrity, your rights are not going to be acknowledged. Right? I'm going to take you. What's your point? Taken. Speaker, you destroyed all your benefits when you talked about omission because whenever your individuals start having families when they enter work, you create all these same harms on your side of the house. But more importantly, your arguments are contingent on buying to the idea that women are unable to balance a professional and personal lifestyle. For you to argue this, you have to structurally prove why it's true and be patriarchal. Thank you assumption that like it is people will not be sexist when they find out that women can balance their lives between their relationship and with their work right yeah, we yeah. tell you large yeah, women yeah. can do that in the status quo but that's not the case people are sexist because they have certain assumptions and stereotypes against women and to the extent that you lie as an additional stereotype upon women we tell you cast not only doubts about previous stereotypes you add upon the structural issues that you only talk about right so even if women can balance corporations can simply say no like 
like and th- they can simply say no you're not balancing your life you should devote more of your life to businesses and they can also say things like ah oh, you should not lie right so back to the second back to the second argument we tell you that it also means that there's going to be less social discourse and less social discussion about female like worker benefits after they give birth and after marriage right essentially what this means is that corporations now have a scapegoat societal conservative now have a scapegoat there's going to be less support for female to do it why is this argument so important right because a lot of women in developing countries are only affording to go to work because of things like maternal leave, because of things like kindergarten and work, that actually offer them a system to combat the patriarchy. When their race, when their sexist family comes and say that, ah, you have to work, you have to be like a domestic labor, they can point out to these benefits and they can say that these benefits allow me to work to the extent, my partner will extend upon this impact. Thus, opposed. Okay, thank you for your speech. I would like to call upon the deputy prime minister. Is the toilet for a minute? So sorry. Okay, make it quick, please. Right, I'm back. Go ahead and start your speaking. Start. Honorable Chair. When opposition talked about the numerous of sexual, of sexist barriers of entries that bar women from accessing equal opportunities and accessing basic human rights like social mobility, they defeated themselves when they told you that the way to challenge these sexual, sexist norms is to allow for women to prove their worth. That is to say, when they talk about women being individuals when they are at, when they are leaders who are extremely assertive, the way to challenge this is to have a diverse range of women who are able to access these opportunities. When they say men are more trustworthy, the only way to challenge this is to allow women to prove their worth within the corporate world and to generate good outcomes for a corporation and to show that they are actually able to balance things like their personal lives with their professional commitments. All these structures are things in which opening government uniquely deals with because the analysis we gave you was that the pernicious act of denying women jobs because they know, because employers know of your relationship status is the fundamental barrier of entry that prevents all social mobilization for women on the ground. But on a second strategic framing, we think it is extremely elitist and infinite of their liberal arrogance on side opposition to believe the fact that you can just purely rely on social movements to fight your cause. This debate isn't centered merely around woke th- first world nations. It applies in South Africa. It applies in China. It applies in India, where women's rights yeah, are yeah. something that are being challenged in the status quo, we think for its individuals, your fundamental priority is for survival. We think on our side of the house, we are able to best challenge sexist norms and break through glass ceilings to structurally prove to you why in my speech. The first thing I'll point out on a macro scale rebuttal is opening opposition takes a direct force in this debate because they concede the harms of our side of the house when they said, maybe you could just omit information and say you're not sure. At the point that we just say this, they concede that women might want to have personal lives later on. And when they do so on your side of the house, you will accrue all these same kinds of harms in which you want to talk about. You need to tell us why that won't destroy your case. I expect the response from second up. Third of all, we need to talk about how social movements are actually the deprioritizing, uh, deprioritizing like acceptance debate. Because in the vast majority of instances, which means 90% of the current world, social mobilization for women isn't as isn't like isn't as structured and it isn't as woke as opposition would want it to be. Which means a lot of individuals are still trapped in patriarchal societies where they aren't even being given access to work. We think on those levels, we're able to challenge it by allowing women to self-survive. But thirdly, they talk about things like 
structural barriers that bar women from getting things like education, such on, such forth. We think John specifically told you why getting a job allows for you to challenge these things in the future, because getting a job means getting money. Getting money means being able to access things like political lobbying, being able to access things like actually going for rallies without worrying about your next day. These are opportunities that come exclusively on site government, even in the history of women's rights, the individuals who led such social mobilizations were individuals who were able to access some form of corporate job. Individuals were able to access some form of social mobility. They don't tell us why they're able to access all those benefits on their side of the house. Before I move on. Take him. Do you think it is justified for women to lie about other women and name and shame them for personal promotion? No, this is perfectly fine if it comes to that extent because if it means you being able to forward your own ideals, we are absolutely fine with you preserving your own self-interest in that case. But this isn't the debate panel because this debate is about uniquely allowing women to access self-defense against a patriarchal norm that that's literally crushing women in the status quo. First argumentation of this debate, how we are able to break through glass ceilings that currently shackle women on the ground. What are the glass ceilings are talking about? Things like not getting a job, things like the norm that you're unable to balance a professional and personal life, things like nature, uh, things like paternity leave is actually something that harms corporations and these are all issues in which you're able to break through. Why is, good, why is this going to happen? Number one, precisely because of the analysis opposition wanted to tell us that the only way you're going to solve these issues is to allow these individuals to prove their worth and to show corporations that there is an ability to help them to balance their personal and professional life. We think it's extremely morally reprehensible that opposition did not deal with our argumentation that this is uniquely a form of attack on your identity and on your gender. That men who have sexual lives, who have relationships, are not being attacked on the same level, even though they might also be emotional, even though they are also individuals who are prone to breakdowns. This is an unfair and unjust way of entry that we think women should be allowed to use lying as a way of accessing these opportunities as a whole. Second level, how is lying something that's uniquely effective in allowing these individuals to pursue their rights and break through glass ceilings? Number one, because it deals with the first bear of entry which allows you to pursue opportunities, but the second, when you're internally inside a corporation, we think that's where you're able to change societal norms on a larger scale. Because I would like you, panel, to see this debate not just as a single woman entering a corporation, but billions of women around the world entering each and every corporation, showing employers that they're actually able to balance a professional and personal life and allow these individuals to access things like promotions and opportunities, specifically when they are more capable than the men who are currently in power. We cannot deny the status quo. That is that the patriarchal norm has affected society to the point in which 90% of corporate jobs are given to men. The 90% of CEOs are individuals who are men. That this is a normative that opposition will never be able to change on their side of the house. Even if our benefits don't materialize to the fullest extent possible, which is maybe we don't get as many trailblazers as we want. We are still having an opportunity to integrate more individuals into a work system. That we aren't relying on benevolent states to apply code systems for your individual to survive. We think on a third level, how this uniquely leads to a large amount of corp or change on, a, or on the ground is how you uniquely challenge patriarchal norms. Here's where we will directly engage with opposition on this. We would argue the opposition is actually complicit and even to an extent directly culpable in perpetuating patriarchal norms on their side of the house. Because if you note the language of opposition's argumentation, it is still premised on the idea that they believe that women are unable to balance personal and professional lives. They believe that paternal leave means you're going to not commit to your job when there are actually a ton of other alternatives in which can apply. Things like working from home, things like actually balancing time. These are issues in which women's, women are able to access on all sides of the house uniquely. We think of opposition when women aren't allowed to use lie as a form of self-defense to get their basic rights from the get-go, they are unable to challenge the structures as a whole. Which means opposition isn't arguing more harm than good. Opposition is arguing from a position of complacency and uncomplicity. They're doing nothing even though they recognize the harms which are currently being inflicted upon women all over the world. We think it's morally reprehensible for them to not respond to the argumentations we give you on how women are directly targeted in a form of assault. We say if individuals who are gay, who have different identities, are able to closet themselves to their own self-interest and benefits, we say women should be able to access this to and challenge a patriarchal norm that for far too long has shackled them. Okay, thank you, DPM, for your speech. I would like to call upon the LO to continue their case within seven minutes. Here, here.
Can everyone hear me like this? Yep, go ahead. Start. I think Team, Korea, Team Malaysia sounds pretty, but they don't give you much analysis on why this particular policy will lead to the impact that they want to give you. I think the first on stance, two points of rebuttal, then moving on to, uh, to, to summarizing the opening half of the debate. Our stance is very simple. I think the best way for us to reach gender equality on you separating individual lives from the life of workplace is for you to never allow em employers to ask about your, your individual preferences in terms of relationship or marriage. We'll later prove to you why that is can only be done under our side of the house. But just note, it is unlike what DPM tells you that we're conceding the case by agreeing with a side of omission. Because all the impacts that LL tells you are about why lying is particularly bad. You're not conceding to anything the moment in which you're not lying. That doesn't feel conservative power and that doesn't hurt other women who might actually try to get these jobs. We are the oh. one who actually benefits individuals on our side of the house. Two points of rebuttal then. I think the first argument about why patriarchy exists is can be largely conceded to. I don't think we live in a world where we don't believe that patriarchy exists. But look at this. Hypothetically speaking, with or without being married or with or without being in a relationship status, their analysis still stands. That is to say, men still view women as emotionally and mentally inferior. They are inferior and submissive regardless of whether or not they're in a relationship or not. And therefore that perception change doesn't shift just by the moment in which you say you do not belong to a relationship. But or moreover, even if that is the case, I think it is expected in terms of what patriarchy is as of right now, to expect certain to expect women to even if you don't have plans right now, that you have plans in the future. That is to say, they don't really change the calculus if we do, uh, calculus among male oh, employers course. about whether or not these individuals are actually ones who might opt into a relationship in the future, even if they say no on their side of the house. They don't get the impact they want to talk to you on their side of the house. Second, then, in their case about self-defense is logically sound a uh, logically sound but it's not other, no other than an intuition pump we gave you several reasons that ll pointed towards you that went unresponded to by the dp prime minister why is that so one i think the first response is other women are hurt in your uh, ideas. I think self-defense works the moment in which you try to defend yourself, but you cannot drag half of the entire global population along with you the moment in which you try to defend yourself. That is your first premise, not, uh, not fine. Two, I think the reason why self-defense is used as a last resort is literally because it is the last resort. That is to say, you have no alternatives, unlike what Jews did, Jews had no alternatives, but the alternatives exist on our side of the house. The moment in which you had say that, no, I will not provide those information for you, and if enough women do do that, there, have been, there are lawsuits being passed around the world that requires employers to not ask personal information that is uh, seen in uh, Europe and etc. like that. I think that is more long-term method for you to get impact the change. Just understand this principle at large, point, point. one that is impact related. That is to say, point, you have right. to prove somewhat of the impact for them to do so. But more importantly, just look at the PPM speech that tells you. They tell you that billions of people will get into these kind of employers. Look, this is a one-off policies. Employers aren't dumb. If they have, if there are individual employees getting into the jobs primarily because of the fact they lied about their relationship status and the fact that two years later they actually like have a kid, oh, etc. Yeah. I think those are moments in which employers realize that they are being lied to. Other ways include the fact that. They just differentiate themselves by skills. I think there are a lot of employers who value women for their empathetic and collaborative skill that exists. I think that's a very good skill to have, I don't, uh, uh, et cetera. Great then, two points of analysis oh, on opposition. One, why is it principally unjustified for you to lie? To, uh, why is it principally unjustified for you to lie? One, because you are never allowed to push for staying silent anymore. That is to say, the moment in oh, which yeah. you declare yourself one who is, uh, you declare yourself one who is not likely going to opt into this relationship, you are un uh, you are unlikely to sign petitions within your companies to asking your employers to not reveal those information because now you'll be seen as weak, as if you are hiding oh, any, yeah. uh, hiding something. You're not likely to march on rallies around the world who require those kind of prosecute uh, those kind of petitions to take place. Those are actual long-term changes that eradicate that kind of behavior from employers. I think that is more suitable change that exists. Secondly, then, because the mass turning, uh, this the mass lying 
the oh, U.S. conservative comment. Why is that true? I think the important thing to note is that conservatives already view these kind of individual uh, views family breeding as the most uh, fam family rearing is the most important thing. The moment in which women try to lie about their families to get into jobs are the moments when conservatives are more aroused up about whether or not women should stay in the family at large. But secondly, just understand how conservatives Point. are all like monetary, like money people who are in large chains of CEO commands who actually care about their Point. financial Point. values. The moment in which they can go to court and say that. Like, oh, maybe we shouldn't allow them to do so and they shouldn't file lawsuits as such. Primarily because of the fact that they lie to us in interviews, those are strong defenses that conservative judges are likely to buy based on their preferences. Last thing then, they are not principally justified to do so because it harms other women in particular ways. I think there are jobs that requires a lot of time commitment, that requires individuals Point. to commit a certain amount of time. This is like, regardless of whether you're a man or woman, those are women who, who are willing to sacrifice their time for well being in order to fulfill, fulfill the jobs requirement that they want. All those points towards the fact that you're undermining those women and those women's rights the moment you do so. I'll take one from closing. Taken. You say you would rather that interviews didn't ask these questions in the first place. But how do you change that behavior when the perception of women as risky hires persists on your side when you don't do anything about the norm? Here, here. It's, it's not like we don't do anything about the norm. It's about the fact that the moment in which you don't lie and you don't, you don't lie about it, you can sign petitions within your corporations asking your company to never ask these questions. You can, uh, you can actually, uh, like, can go out to march for these kind of questions to be reduced without fearing that your companies will come after you. Second argument then about why you destroy the future prospects of women. And understand this takes down governments of impact because their impact is relied on whether or not women actually get involved. First thing then. Opera management who interview you are less likely going to trust you anyway, the moment in which uh, you lie to them. That is to say, your current boss who interview you in your companies will not have hard tasks to you because now they're doubting whether or not uh, they're, they're doubting whether or not you're a trustworthy individual, especially in the chain of command, especially because patriarchy exists. They're less uh, more likely to doubt you. But more importantly, and this is very crucial, is because the moment in which you do so is a moment in which they doubt all other women whether or not they actually lie, even though they might not. But more crucially, they don't doubt only this part of the interview. They doubt every single part of the interview. Because on government's principle, you can lie about just about everything on your resume. Those are the moments when women start, when employers start doubting every single part of women's resume, whether or not they should be handed jobs. Those are the moments in which women do not rise up the corporate ranks because of lies they committed at the very initial beginning. We think women can get into companies anyway. This is a far more strategic and long-term goal. Extremely proud to oppose. Okay, thank you for your speech. I would like to call upon the member of government to start the opening half of this debate within seven minutes. Here, here. Um, hello, is it possible for you to wait for like 30 seconds before you start? Oh, uh, sure. Mm -hmm. um, is it fine for the judges as well? Yep, 30 seconds. Yeah. Thank you. Um, no, I'm really sorry for pausing this um, here now. Okay, cool. So, member of government, whenever you're ready. Start. I'm going to do three things for member of government, right? First, I'm going to prove to you what's been absent in this debate about why hiring is uniquely the place for us to get the benefits from the risk of having told a lie in a workplace. Second, why we think necessarily financial independence is key for empowerment in this world. And lastly, why exactly we think this is the way that we mechanize change for women in terms of workplace discrimination, right? But before that, three things, uh, it's a few rebuttals, right? First, we think when opening opposition argue that the reason we, sh we don't want these questions to be asked 
is because they think these questions by premise themselves are unfair, that they are not relevant to workplace performance. Except they do not realize that the cost of say, saying that, no, I'm not going to answer the question, and also saying admittedly yes, is pretty much the same onto the woman, but is also not really useful in the mechanism that they really want us to offer. And why does this occur, right? And this is, I'll talk about this more deeply, but it's also, it occurs more because we think there are way too many factors that go into a hiring decision that lets corporates get away with like whether or not this specific answer was the reason why you rejected a certain individual, right? So how do I talk, uh, how do I talk about this, right? We think, first of all, when you talk about hiring, it's about taking a chance on someone, right? Because when someone is being added to it, especially at the entry level, where we expect most of the women to like really need to have to lie about their relationship status and their future plans, because someone's taking a risk on them, they don't have much like work experience to perhaps back up on. We think people tend to rely on something that they can know and trust, like someone who's from the same college as you, or sometimes that extends to someone who's the same gender as you, right? And because these are private closed rooms, which tell you results that are supposed to be your worth, like about your as an individual, we think it is impossible to clearly point to discrimination. This is a direct response to the idea that there is some kind of change possible through like pointing out how these questions are discriminatory. But secondly, we think it is more important for this place to be the place that you lie is simply because of the fact that we think that when you do get into these organizations, you have the ability to be competent and useful and integral to corporate culture, right? We think Ovo's conception of how corporates value their employees is very childish and restrictive, right? We think they imagine themselves as little children who hold like a little grudge for a minor light toll, right? And we think on a secondary level, employers are the kind of employers that we think this debate is not about is the kind that would never hire a woman anyway, right? That are so 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 suspicious of all women simply because of the Point. fact that they heard that some woman got pregnant on the job or some woman said she'd never she'd never get pregnant and did, right? We think these men are likely to punish any woman for any minor like perceived misstep, even if it really isn't, right? So we don't think this debate is really about those kinds of employers. I think even if you do tell the truth, you're unlikely to ever get into these jobs. Like even if all, even if only young women get got her into these jobs, we think they'd eventually lose like their like their position because of the kind of toxicity that exists in the workplace. But what do I mean by this? We think this changes in a very soft sense of way whether or not these women are worth taking risks on for these corporations, right? And we think the moment at which you are able to cross the barrier of getting hired without like the best resume or the best like history or the best family connection, so on and so forth, which we think women generally tend to lack as compared to men, we think at that point, you have created financial independence for yourself. And why do we think that is particularly relevant in this debate? We think the way women are controlled, and this is not analysis that is about a shallow saying, oh, Point. it's about like getting political capital. But we think access to feminist modes of philosophy, access about believing in your like own worth, being able to imagine yourself as a person in its entirety, often comes from being able to step out from like the domains of your father or your husband or whoever society really d determines is supposed to be your controller because they are the ones who like feed you, clothe you, who have like raised you and who are responsible for your safety, right? We think these imaginations of women particularly become like our, 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 our satellite and their ability to view themselves as people who can even pa imagine participating in a political movement, can even imagine standing up for their own rights only occurs at the point at, at which this financial independence is accessible, right? So if O really wants to talk about, you know, us creating some kind of change, if you want more and more women to really opt into that kind of change, we think women have to be able to step out from like, their, 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 their homes in the past, right? Um, before I move on, I'll take a PR from closing if you have any. Uh, Taken. Okay. You can lie to male interviewers once, twice, maybe three times. How long before do you think these patriarchal interviewers learn their lesson and not trust these lies anymore? Back. 
we are saying and you did miss the mechanism entirely you go into the job and you do well at that job and you become integral integral to the functioning of that com com uh, com uh, community right we think women are often uniquely motivated to do well at their jobs because of how much it has been denied to them to some extent right but let me mechanize what this kind of change looks like right, right we think when women in in certain we think in certain professional communities there's a perception that these certain jobs are too hard for women to handle right maybe you can't put in like the night oil that it requires to be a lawyer if you really have a family or so on and so forth right we think within these small groups when someone finally enters like that that sphere and is able to quite publicly manage work and and so on and so forth we think or if the moment that they is The moment that they decide to have a child, they're fired. We think the ability for even like women's group to be able to pounce on that, these are we pounce on some like way question asked in hiring amongst many others is much higher. But on a secondary level, we think when women are in these in these corporations, they are also able to hire more women, right? They are also able to change the way hiring practices occur, right? So if it is about really legislative change, where does the mechanism, where does the desire, where does the desire of corporates to really cooperate with this kind of legislative change really exist, right? So we think. if this movement is necessarily if this motion is necessarily about where we can create the kind of movement that creates change for people with for, for these women we think that is a world where they have financial independence but on a secondary level we think hiring is probably the best place to do so because we think people employees often expect people to pad their resumes they often expect that what's happened in the past these are what you are right now as a worker matters a lot more really really proud to propose Okay, thank you for your speech. I would like to call upon member of our opposition to provide an extension within seven minutes. Here, here. Um. Yes. Can you give me ten seconds? I'll. Yeah. Sure. Whenever you're ready. Alright. Um. Am I audible? Yes. Here, here. Okay. Great. Hmm. All right. I'll start in five seconds. Panel, we're going to tell you why things in the status quo are getting much more better for for a lot of women all over the world than the, all every other team in this debate has been agreeing to. Because I think this debate mostly has been hinged around 1970s, where things were literally so bad that women couldn't get the job. But the problem right now is much more nuanced than other teams understand. The problem is not that women don't get the job. The problem is that there is a lot of discrimination after they get the job, and even then, when they're offered initially, when they're offered jobs, they are not provided as 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 enough. Avenues of growth as they otherwise would. So the problem is in terms of the avenues of growth and in terms of the pay, rather than not getting job literally. Things are getting better, right? In terms of social movements getting traction all over the world, in terms of feminism, in terms of people coming out and talking about why women, like, like society is very patriarchal and needs to change. Like how a lot of conversations happen around dinner tables all over the world. Why such situation is so much bad, right? Why so many uh, female role models are coming up and uh, creating role models for all every other woman in the society, even in developing countries. There are a lot of policies like affirmative action policies in so many developing countries. Like Nepal, for instance, to make things better. So, a couple of arguments. I'm going to bring two arguments. First, why this is this motion is a classic example of white feminism, and why this further denigrates harms to other minority groups that we should prioritize. Point, and secondly, point. why we have a much more better uh, movement in ours. I'm not going to take any PR until the fifth minute. The CG's case before that. 
there are a couple of things that bring bring in the first in terms of why because of these decisions are behind the scenes so social movements are not possible to influence them i just don't think that is possible i just don't think that makes sense right because social movements are not literally going to people and making them change it's about making changing people's imagination about what matters in the society and who are the vulnerable groups who deserve help in so far as i prove in in my case that movements become much more better much more pervasive in our side we think we win this clash but secondly oh, there's a weird argument about why access to feminist philosophy and imagination happens exclusively in their side this is simply not true because the comparative in our side isn't literally no job for a lot of women is probably less paying job and less avenues of growth that does not mean that the ex ac access oh, to oh, feminist oh. philosophy and imagination is exclusive in their side because even if you have low paying job pro probably the fact that you are oppressed probably the fact that you feel oppressed every single day mean that you actively go out and access these kind of philosophies and imagination and engage in this activism but secondly because, so case is that that's not exclusive secondly i think in most of the society today most of these mainstream philo philosophies are quite mainstream in movies in books so i don't think there is this extension is largely non exclusive for them the oj's case is couple of things i like i think a lot of oj's case about why patriarchy is bad why like self defense is good is literally non like literally non comparative because we're not going to come here and say point, patriarchy point. is good right patriarchy is obviously wrong the question for this debate is how it is solved and that is where the oj tried to the oj co contributed significantly lesser in this debate their point on self defense makes sense principally but just because you have a right to self defense doesn't mean that you have a right to use other women as a human seal just because you think you have self defense there is a responsibility if you have arbitrary privileges even if you are a woman to include, to make to make it possible that other women do not have to go through this per pernicious process and have ability to rise through these kind of patriarchal channels social movements are much more better first in first argument in terms of why this is bad for other women and not here that the o also talked about other women but most of the harms that they talked about are are harms that other women suffer when it is known that women lie but more important for this debate is the precondition of privileges that associate and harm other women specifically because the question as to whether women will be known to lie or not whether there will be a social narrative or not is still tenuous it's not clear for, to me from opening opposition coming from opposition why there will be a much more pervasive narrative as such so the question is rather the precondition of privileges that exist why is this particularly a example of white feminism because the ability to lie also comes from arbitrary privileges that you did not like arbitrary privileges and power point, systems point. in the society is much more point. likely that a white woman is likely to be point, trusted point. than a latino african american or an asian american woman in america is more likely that an upper caste woman is more likely to be trusted in india and nepal rather than a low caste woman the reason why that is is because the interviewer is also likely to be white or probably the interviewer is also affected by negative stereotypes against these minority groups that say that these minority groups should not be trusted but secondly these people also have elitist privilege in terms of wealth in terms of educational institutions that they belong to and be, being white that they did not that they arbitrarily gained the extent to which patriarchy is bad because it creates identity related harms and this is the extent to which that is that is true this is also similarly bad like patriarchy when you use your identity and uh, uh, to disadvantage other women why do we get better moments in our side and help these women prim primarily because like remember in our side right the at the best case in our side i think we have a fire to, fear to say that no woman in our side lies at that point it is much more better and a much more level playing field for point, a point. lot of minority women who do not have playing field right now because of arbitrary because of social systems like racism and capitalism the best case in our side means that it enlarges the who the patriarchal interviewer thinks and patriarchal company thinks the enemy is because every woman in our side doesn't lie in contrast to them lying every single time in their like every single time in their side it uh, they, so it means that companies cannot use inertia because problem does not seem to be small enough in our side of the house but secondly the women role models that we get and the political action the political cap capital that side government so desperately wants women to have is much more legitimate in our side of the house as well because women simply in their side are not credited because of the lying history that they have in their side but more importantly and this is more pernicious there is a shift in narrative focus when you talk about this legitimate role models in women in their side 
from their achievements to their lies in their history that further entrenches bias against women because the focus in you in terms of people women who are women women who succeed is not the hard things that they were able to do even though patriarchal oppressions existed but rather the lies they had to say the lies they said we think that shifts narrative and that is harder but it's also much harder for women in their side right because they constantly have to lie so many times because of the initial lie that they said initially which means a lot of political a lot of action that they otherwise could have done in our side in terms of engaging in meaningful pursuits is restricted in their side because they had to lie ultimately the question for this debate is whether or not we should prioritize fighting against evil social systems rather than giving into them i think we should fight against them as much as we can the provided that the ability to fight against them is already privileged and already arbitrary we think we should fight as much as possible we oppose Okay, thank you for your speech. I would like to call upon the government whip to conclude their case within seven minutes here here. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Start panel. Three clear reasons why CG's extension wins this debate. Firstly, we're the only side that is specific to interviews themselves and why we changed those mechanisms in the first place. Secondly, we believe our principle about the right against arbitrary discrimination is the most uh, is the best principle in the room, like even better than the idea of self-defense. Thirdly, we think we actually wrap around all the, uh, all the stakeholders in this debate in terms of showing how if this debate is about the change to women and their communities, we think we're the one that delivers it the best. I'm going to talk about CO first, then, talk, then go to O, and then differentiate ourselves from opening up. Largely, there is no extension from closing opposition. Right? They say that uh, there are other ways of discrimination without ever showing how those improve. But we showed you from our side how this actually improves when, this, when the conception that you have of women are being risky hires actually goes down. They have no mechanism to empower them. They say that social movements can do that job, right? We believe social movements, and this part of Arushi's speech is that social movements are really ineffective when A, you can't access them. And secondly, when you keep getting reinforcement from conservative societies that this is, in fact, your fault that you didn't get hired. It's, in fact, the way that you should live, right? We think they never engage with the idea that to access those social movements, you often need financial independence. Therefore, all of the benefits of closing opposition actually work when you give them our model in the first place, right? But their stakeholder is about like, we need to change the lives of women once they do get a job. You think it's a far narrower stakeholder than all the women that we're talking about. The ones that are trying to get a job, the ones that get rejected from jobs on a daily basis, the ones which are going to reach that stage where they get a job in the first place. We think on the, on like, given that they've restricted this debate to a very narrow stakeholder, we don't understand why their extension should be prioritized in this room in the first place, right? But then they say there are other ways of learning norms. We stay specific to the hiring process in terms of the exchange of information on whether or not you should hire a certain community. That means that those norms never change unless you're able to create positive conceptions about these women in the workplace in the first place, right? But then they say, like, and this is probably the only contribution from their side, is that um, you should not, like, you know, um, make make it harder for other women to actually come through, right? We think that's we think the difference here is like when there are women who can't access this ability to lie, how do we actually emancipate them? We emancipate them Point. and we've shown you a model by which we get more recruiting, uh, we get more women on recruiting boards who can break down these unfair recruiting practices in the first place. We believe that some women have to break yeah, these yeah. barriers in the first place to get that sort of change in the first place. Otherwise, we don't understand how those conceptions Point. targeted at those vulnerable minorities really go away. I'll take you later. Moving on from closing opposition to opening opposition. What do we get, right? They say that not all stereotypes go away, completely uncomparative, right? We think some stereotypes in terms of women in and of themselves being risky hires go away at the point where some women are able to pitch themselves by saying that, point. look, I have all the availab availabilities that my fellow male employees have. Why aren't you treating me fairly? In that sense, when they say there's going to be some, some sort of backlash because you're like, ah, like women lie, we think they need to engage with the comparative. We think the sort, the sort of perception already exists during job interviews. Just that job interviews and those chambers are far more opaque. So therefore, when a woman doesn't get employed, we think there's no ability to question them because often these things aren't overt. At the point at which there's this like overriding conception uh, or like some random people start saying or some bosses start saying that women on the whole are untrustworthy, given that we've shown you how we get more women in the workplace in the first place, 
there's a greater ability to challenge those norms right but more importantly you think it's oh, justified yeah. for women to do this because it's largely the only way right they have to show us how there's some other mechanism for women to be able to change these norms look you can't change the way hiring practices work but what you can Point. change is your approach to them and ensuring those processes improve in the future right it's only on our side when you get more women in through conducive ideas about what they can pr- provide to the workplace where you get concrete change that only happens on our side of the house right but then l- lastly they talk about like um like the calculation of interviews don't change and you can still have skill differentiation within the workplace is that skill differentiation going to be intrinsically valued when you still feel doubtful about point. whether this person is going to leave your company at any point in time right when you have these women who give them that sort of assurance that no i am not i'm like as trustworthy as your male employees it breaks down the crucial perception within male employees so therefore all the arbitrary discrimination that they talk about which happens within the workplace point. is largely due to this idea that you can't trust them inherently as much as you can trust men we break that down when these women are able to portray themselves as just as trustworthy just as accountable right but then we think they'll then they say like some pretty ridiculous things right they say like if you want change you can sign petitions like why would you why would you get any credibility for those signed petitions when the norms themselves haven't changed right the only way you can get change within your workplace is when you counter toxic narratives within the workplace if they do exist look a burden isn't to say that like uh, women are always going to lie right just that in the instances that they do Point. you think it's justified to do so but more importantly given that some organizations are going to continue to be sexist the only way to challenge that sort of rhetoric is when you're able to leverage your power within the workplaces to band together and then say that this is not the way women should work right we acknowledge that on both sides of the house you're trying to reduce those biases we just believe that from open from closing government we're the only side that mechanizes how you would do it before i proceed i'll take clo- opening take it your your argument relies on women being flawless and successfully move up the corporate ladder despite all other patriarchal practices you might get 10% more women in the workplace but if one of them fail at just once sexist interviewers will point towards their resume and say that did you lie in any other parts of this cv too because you lied on that damn part it's an absolute exaggeration to say that just because a woman lied there'll be this conception that our ah, women are like bad because they lie even if that's the case the fact that such a ridiculous narrative is being spread at the workplace means that even some men even some people who are on the fence are going to say look that's bullshit right we think the ability to call those sorts of things out at the workplace is significantly different and significantly only created on our side of the house finally why do we think we take it over opening government the exclusive ideas that you get from us are a how financial independence gives you a greater value to self so therefore all the conceptions that og talks about that they want to change truly get enabled on our side of the house when you say that your attachment to these movements to these liberal ideas only comes when you're able to distance yourself from a conservative from a conservative locks right but more importantly we talk about how we unlock entirely new genres of work for women in terms of fields which are meant as being like you know not suitable for women because they're like you require too much commitment the fact that these women can break that barrier of commitment means that we're able to expand more options which is more principally justified than our opening says in terms of a vague idea of how those outcomes are going to accrue within workplaces themselves right but then when they say like their m- m- most principal justification is that this liberates women they don't explain how that works in the first place we tell you why you give them more options you break down societal perceptions of why they're risky hires that's the way you do it finally on the principle that they have about like self defense we think they had to do a lot more work to show why it is the last resort they also don't respond to op saying that you can't bring other women arbitrary discrimination is something which you stand for as a community we think that's the most relevant principle in this debate extremely proud to propose okay thank you for your speech i would like to call upon the opposition whip to conclude this debate in seven minutes here here oh, am i audible yes you are thank you start In seven minutes of government whip speech, we are no response whatsoever to the idea of accessibility of lie. Who is best able to lie under their side? It's white women who already have privilege, who oftentimes use these narratives, use these lies to benefit themselves, which comes at cost of other women being left out. Who are these other women? These women are under. These women are underprivileged. They do not have enough education. They probably. Uh, they probably did not have similar degree of access. to whatever the white women had lies the best case scenario under their side is few privileged women will get into the job interviews but my problem with that is a why do these privileged women who probably had good quality education were exposed to private system of education etc will need to get will need to lie extensively to get hired 
in in uh, in the starting level in the first place in the entry level jobs in the first place we're unclear as to why lying is the only mechanism for from them that's the reason as to why government bends at ex as extremely difficult task of winning winning this debate but let's look at this debate Point. in a compare in a, in a comparative i'll take oz definitely in 4 minutes uh, okay first our argumentation about harms harms and barriers of entry opening said that barriers of entry are multifaceted there is patriarchy there are other factors that affects too we completely agree our extension to it which is more important in this debate is this harms entry of other women what does this mean this harms entry of two kinds of women first minority which i have already justified but second women who do not want to lie that is to say women who want to be open and clear about their life and their choices who are self empowered to believe what they want to that that their choices of raising a family raising a child should not affect their lives etc will be further succumbed by patriarchal structure who wants women to not speak up these women are silenced further further more but second they get away with silencing these women and these forms of discrimination in closed spaces like closing ones to believe how so they will then go on to say if someone calls them out for sexism we have hired 10 women look at this statistically we are not racist etc how does that justify many women that has been left that have been left out because either a they choose to be self reliant within themselves not lie or b if they were not privileged enough to lie we see we think this is intr intrinsically harmful to a lot of women who are who are suffering because of patriarchal structure opening government then goes on and blames us so much for being patriarchal i think that's absurd we don't support patriarchy at all first second we think things are getting better because we're not debating this in 1970s where second wave of feminism was just starting we're literally debating this in 2020 where even the most conservative countries in the world are now incorporating things such as affirmative actions and encouraging encouraging Point. encouraging education of minority women uh, in, in, in you know through policies such as beti but beti padao beti padao beti bachao etc etc in india etc 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 right that is to say things are actually getting better there are many 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 role models many women who have taken up uh, taken up up in the corporate ladders there are many women who are who are now political leaders etc these women are role models the point in time government side fails to prove that women needs to exclusively lie to get into job is the point where oz loses this debate but second why does closing government's argumentations a lot of them which i i ang sonam really responded well to which i hear no comparative from them later on is this idea about their idea about you know hiring is different because it's in a close space etc is exclusive it's different i agree to that however their analysis literally is you shut shut the door down you don't know about conversations they do not credit the movements they do not credit what the movements have achieved in the present things such as me to movement things such as other variant of feminist movement has has surpassed this barriers created by corporations and corporate media for a large period of time that is to say even if you are harassed and discriminated inside these rooms you can still call them out you can still fight against them that is to say Point. that the alternative that we present to you is better right that that is you probably can access these movements a lot more but before i move on i'll take opening taken this debate is about why lying is justified are you okay with the women not lying when it could be a determinant factor where they get a job to survive in nigeria or not we give you two principles on why it is objectively harmful and why this is necessary for them to preserve their own life your response is premised on a poi which we have knocked down from the start please respond to the 7 minute argument Thank you. Okay I think self defense is self defense when self defense actually helps you do something and it does not come at cost of multiple other people who are probably lesser privileged than you uh, being affected right because the principle of self defense here would be true Point. if women had no avenues whatsoever women have avenues we have proven to you opening tries to do it we do it substantially better but second our argumentations a lot of them which were ignored right first is this idea about women who will live through you know probably a larger stress in terms of in terms of having to live through their lives right because one trust me lying is stressful because you you have to pretend to do a lot of things you, you probably don't do that you probably create this friction this friction between your you know your uh, office space and your personal space etc 
etc etc which is probably detrimental to your own mental health as well as well at many times you probably have to skip a lot of office parties you probably have to give white lies that probably not people won't believe etc 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 these women are still likely to face a lot of these harms but why do we think that closing opposition in this debate comparatively is best place to take this debate because we first of all mitigate the kind of harms uh, okay, harms that is been portrayed by both the government bends we argue that status quo has actually evolved and status quo has actually changed but more so we also told you how their side does not necessarily include the women that they want to include we're unclear as to how a minority women for example a, 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 a you know for example a dalit women in india or nepal would prop potentially get into a corporate hierarchy under their side as well especially when there are multifaceted structural barriers not just patriarchy but also racism casteism etc existing we're unclear as to why their harms is still perceiving under their side the reason as to why closing government closing opposition is first in this debate but nothing else is because our argumentation are the ones that are closer to reality our argumentation also interact with all of the points that are brought forth by them we'll give closing government a credit and argue that this is a closing off debate because opening opposition fails to justify at what forms of harm that opening up what forms of harm these women who are left out are going to be feeling what forms of changes would they be bringing potentially under their side under our side ability to collectivize for a larger group of women against discrimination that happens in an open door a closed door with a within the interview structure uh, is much higher vote co okay thank you for your speech um me and 